Good afternoon. I'm Brother David, and this is Happy Cross Ministries Basic Bible Study. This afternoon we're going to be looking at the least portions of Luke chapter 1. A little bit about Luke. Luke began his gospel in a logical, orderly manner by setting forth first the reason for his undertaking and then describing the background of the one who would serve as the forerunner of the Messiah, John the Baptist, was set to prepare the way for Jesus. The singular purpose for John's life can be seen in the remarkable circumstances associated with his birth and early development. The fidelity of John's parents was continued in the ministry of the son of whom the fidelity of John's parents was continued in the ministry of the Son whom God gave to them. This is the prologue. We're just a little bit of a prologue to Luke's Gospel. <clears throat> Luke uh, chapter 1 verses 1 through 4. And let's go ahead and read those real quickly here. Let me pull them up here. Here we go. Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, beginning in verse 1. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> that is the prologue to the Gospel of Luke. As polished as a polished and refined writer, Luke would be expected to preface a composition as important as this work with appropriate introductory remarks. Every friend of God can be assured by the things which Luke recorded. The testimony of others, we see that in verses 1 and 2, by the time Luke wrote his gospel, approximately 30 years had elapsed since the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. During that time, various accounts of the earthly life of the ministry of Jesus had been written, with the exception, with the exception of the Gospels of Matthew and Mark. However, none of those accounts was inspired by God. Those other writers were generally sincere, no doubt, but they were not free from error, even though some of them had been actual eyewitnesses of the things about which they wrote. While their contributions were probably helpful to many people, they could not be authoritative. Only the divinely inspired scriptures can be so regarded. Since Luke was not an eyewitness to the things about which he would write, it might have seemed presumptuous for him to undertake what others could be considered more qualified than he had already done. Luke's qualifications exceeded by far those of the others because he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to record this account. <coughs> Excuse me again. The testimony of Luke, verses 3 and 4. Let's look at those once again. Verses 3 and 4. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. That Luke was impelled by the Holy Spirit to join others in telling about the earthly life and ministry of Jesus indicates those accounts were lacking either in accuracy or adequacy. He had a thorough, that is a perfect, understanding of what he intended to record as his natural powers of perception and reasoning were enhanced by the Holy Spirit. Luke's undertaking was made primarily for a man who was addressed as most excellent Theophilus. We see that in verse 3. The Greek form for most excellent appears four times in the New Testament. Twice as most excellent. We see that in Luke chapter 1 verse 3 and again in Acts chapter 23 verse 26. And twice as most noble. We see that in Acts 
chapter 24, verse 3, and Acts chapter 26, verse 25. Thus, it is obvious that Theophilus was, such, was someone of considerable rank. <coughs> well, what is not so clear, however, is the relationship between Luke and Theophilus. The name Theophilus essentially means friend of God. Whether or not Theophilus was a believer in Jesus Christ is not certain, but the attention he received from Luke indicates that he was certainly supportive of the Christian's cause. Now let's take a look at uh, Luke chapter 1 verses 5 through 10. Let me pull those up here. And we'll take just a moment on this computer. Luke chapter 1 verses 5 through 10 beginning in verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. And they had no child, because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. And it came to pass, that while he executed the priest's office before God, and the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his law was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. <clears throat> Having explained the motives for his undertaking, Luke immediately proceeded to the task at hand, since he intended to give a record from the very first, a comprehensive account of the life and ministry of Jesus would require at least some attention to the one who was sent to prepare the way for the Messiah. A brief sketch of the parents of John the Baptist was a logical beginning point. Their ancestry. We see that in verse 5. And let's go back and look at that again. There were in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias, of the course of Abia, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Excuse me. Although Herod had the title of king, he was actually the governor of the Roman province of Judea. He was a king only because the Roman authorities allowed him to use that title. Both Zacharias and Elizabeth, the parents of John the Baptist, were members of the tribe of Levi. Elizabeth was a direct descendant of Aaron, Israel's first high priest. The phrase, the course of Abia, referred to the group of priests to which Zacharias belonged. When David reorganized the priesthood in preparation for the temple and its expanded ceremonies, he divided the priest into 24 groups or orders. We see that in 1 Chronicles chapter 24 verses 1 through 19. The priest function, the priestly functions would rotate among the various orders with each order serving for a week at a time at the temple. Their righteousness, we see that in verse 6. And let's look at verse 6 once again. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. Even more important than the lineal heritage of Zacharias and Elizabeth was their relationship with God. Their standing with God is reflected in the expression, righteous before God. They were righteous because they believed in the Messiah who was to come. Zacharias and Elizabeth had a standing before man that was characterized by their walk or their daily lives. Their fidelity to God was such that they were blameless in the manner in which they obeyed his commandments. No one could charge them with living inconsistently with their profession to be followers of the true God. Zacharias and Elizabeth had an inner righteousness before God and a righteousness which could be seen by others in their faithful observance of God's law. Their disappointment, this look at verse 7, talks about their disappointment. And they had no child, because that Elizabeth, because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. 
although Zacharias and Elizabeth were highly respected and esteemed by all their relatives, friends, and acquaintances, there was a big void in their lives. They had no children, and for Jewish couples of that time, to be childless was especially disappointing because of the high value that was placed on parenthood. Compounding the problem was that Zacharias and his wife had passed the normal age of having children. One can only imagine, therefore, the heartache and anguish that they had suffered throughout the years. Zacharias service. Let's look at verses 8 and 9. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. Each priestly order served at the temple only a couple of times per year. Thus an individual priest would have only a relatively, relatively few opportunities to function in the temple ceremonies during his entire tenure of service. When it came, when it came time for the chorus of Abia to serve, Zacharias had the responsibility, a duty determined by casting lots. Compare this with Proverbs chapter 16, verse 33. A duty, to, a duty determined by casting lots and ministering at the altar of incense. That ceremony was part of the daily offering at the temple. In conjunction with the morning and evening sacrifices, incense would be sprinkled on the burning coals which had been taken from the large bronze altar in the courtyard and placed on the smaller golden altar that stood in the holy place of the temple. When the incense hit the fiery embers, a fragrant aroma wafted upward, thus depicting the prayers which are lifted up to God by His people. Compare this with Psalm chapter 14, I'm sorry, Psalm chapter 141, verse 2, and Revelation chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. Okay, the people's praying. Let's look at verse 10 once again. People's praying. I want to find it here. Here we go. <laughs> and the, Verse 10. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. Since the daily offerings were so closely associated with prayer, the times of those offerings came to be regarded as times of prayer. Some examples of this can be observed because on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit descended on the members of the first church at the third hour of the day. That would be 9 a.m. We see that in Acts chapter 2, verse 15. And on a later occasion, Peter and John went to the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m. We see that in Acts chapter 3, verse 1. Some scholars have suggested that since there was a multitude of people in the courtyard praying while Zacharias ministered in the temple, the occasion under consideration must have been a Sabbath. A Sabbath would have given more people than usual the opportunity to go to the temple at a time when many of them would otherwise have been engaged in work or other necessary activities. Now let's go look at verses 11 through 17. This is the announcements of John's birth. And I need to pull this up here. This computer is being a little bit slow today. And in case you had not noticed, I am reading from the King James Version. I'm going to get a drink before I read that scripture. Luke chapter 1, verses 11 through 17, beginning in verse 11. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. 
and thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Not only would John the Baptist play a vital role in the divine plan of redemption, but his birth would be a remarkable, even miraculous event. Consequently, God made a special announcement regarding the birth of the one who would serve as the forerunner for the Messiah. The angel's appearance. Let's look at verses 11 and 12 once again. <clears throat> and there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. <clears throat> when Zacharias approached the altar of incense, let me back up here in my notes a little bit. Okay, no, I don't need to. When Zacharias approached the altar of incense, he beheld a dramatic, startling vision, a messenger of God standing on the right side of the altar, the position of honor, suddenly appeared before the faithful priest. This was the first time in 400 years that a human being had received a specific message directly from God. Those centuries, marked by the closing of Malachi's prophetic ministry and the appearance of the angel to Zacharias, are sometimes called the silent interim between the Old and New Testaments. Zacharias' reaction to the vision of the angel is certainly understandable. Others before him had reacted similarly in such a situation. Look at Judges chapter 13 verses 1 through 22, Judges chapter 6 verse 22, and Daniel chapter 10 verses 5 through 21. The fact that Zacharias was immediately troubled and fear fell upon him is certainly noteworthy. Zacharias was possibly elated that the lot had fallen on him to offer the incense, but he certainly had no inkling of the remarkable experience that awaited him when he stood before the golden altar. Now here's the angel's announcement. Let's look at verses 13 through 17 once again. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John, and thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many time, and many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. <coughs> Immediately, the heavenly messenger, the heavenly messenger, calmed Zacharias' fears. He also told the faithful priest that his prayer for a child would be answered. Since Elizabeth was beyond the time of normal childbearing, Zacharias probably no longer made such requests. However, for many years, he and his wife undoubtedly did pray fervently for children. Now, at long last, when no one would expect an answer to prayers that had been offered so long ago, God would give them a son. The angel's announcement to Zacharias included three important matters. Number one was the son, verses 13 and 14. Let's look at those once again. Verses 13 and 14. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. <clears throat> Clearly and emphatically, the angel told Zacharias that his wife would have a son who was to be named John. That name is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew, of the Hebrew Johanan, both of which mean Jah is, short, is a shortened form of Jehovah, is gracious. 
So that, that word, that name means Jehovah is gracious. The most vivid manifestation of divine grace was God's gift of Jesus Christ as the Savior of mankind. As a forerunner of the Messiah, John the Baptist would certainly play an important role in that wonderful gift. God was gracious to Zacharias and Elizabeth, and he is also gracious to all humanity. A Nazarite. Let's look at verse 15 once again. Verse 15, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and he shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. The stipulation that John was not to partake of wine, the product of grapes, or strong drink, the product of other fruits and grains, indicates that he was to be reared as a Nazarite. Look at Numbers chapter 6, chapter 6 verses 1 through 8. The reason was that he had been chosen by God for a specific and special task, as underscored that he would be filled with the Holy Spirit from birth. Similar statements were made regarding Jeremiah. Look at Jeremiah chapter 1 verses 4 and 5. 4 and 5 and of the Apostle Paul. Look at Galatians chapter 1 verse 15. Each of these men had to trust Jesus as Savior and respond to the call of God. The divine purpose for Jeremiah, John, and Paul did not negate the exercise of free will on the part of any of those men. A prophet. Let's look at verses 16 and 17 once again. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Although John the Baptist was the son of a priest, he served as a prophet. The respective ministries of John and Zacharias provided a vivid contrast between the two functions. A priest went before God on behalf of the people, while a prophet took a message from God to the people. John's ministry would be after the manner of Elias, or that would be Elijah, who was one of the best known and highly revered of all the Old Testament prophets. By baptizing those who responded to his message of repentance, John made ready a people prepared for the Lord. And now we come to the reaction to the angel's announcement. Luke chapter 1 verses 18 through 25, and it's going to take me a moment to pull those up. <laughs> and here we go. Luke chapter 1 verses 18 through 25, once again. If my words don't mess with what's in your Bibles because I'm reading from the King James Version. Okay. Luke chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. And Zacharias said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, and to show these and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb, and not able to speak, until the day that these things shall be performed. Because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. And the people waited for Zacharias, and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak unto them, and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned unto them, and remained speechless. And it came to pass, that as soon as those days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house, and after those days his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me, to take away my reproach among men. 
Zachariah's response to the angel's announcement might have been understandable from the human standpoint, but it was unacceptable as far as God was concerned. Zachariah sought confirmation of what he had been told, but the sign he received was not one which he would have chosen. Zachariah's step, let's look at verses 18 through 20 once again. <coughs> Zacharias is down. And Zacharias said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand, that stand in the presence of God, and I am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb, and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. Zachariah's problem was that he could not see the issue from any perspective other than the human one. He was correct in his facts, as he and, his Liz and Elizabeth were both elderly. However, since God had sent an angel to give the glad tidings to Zacharias, it should have been obvious that divine intervention into the matter was at hand. The angel identified himself as Gabriel, a name which essentially means God is mighty. In the Old Testament, it warns man of God. What seemed, humanity, what seemed humanly impossible was not beyond the capability of divine power. Perhaps it should be noted that Gabriel is one of the three angels whose names are included in the scriptures. The other two are Michael, who is designated as the archangel, and Lucifer, who became Satan. Since Michael was called one of the chief princes, it is widely believed that Gabriel and Lucifer were also archangels, or chief princes, among the angels. Lucifer, of course, rebelled against the Lord, and in so doing, not only became Satan or the devil, but also led a third of the angels into disobedience. Because Zacharias questioned Gabriel's wonderful promise of a long-desired son, he was unable to speak until John was born. One can only imagine how frustrating it must have been for Zacharias to be unable to talk about the son, which at long last was going to be given to him. And we're going to stop right there. And we will pick up next Tuesday around 1 or 2 in the afternoon. I'm sorry, next Monday around 1 or 2 in the afternoon as we continue this lesson. And we'll be picking up at the people's perception of why Zacharias was in the altar, was in the temple, I'm sorry, was in the temple so long. And we'll be picking up once again in Luke chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. As we explore the birth of John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, the Messiah, the Anointed One, our Savior. Folks, if you do me a favor before you get off the computer, go to Facebook and type in on there, uh, on Facebook, search bar, Empty Cross Ministries, and just give a like to our page. That would be a great encouragement to us. And share this program with all your friends and in all the pages that you're able to share on, on Facebook and Twitter and Google Chrome and all those other places. We need to get lots of men, we need to get lots of witness, listeners here, okay? Stay safe, be blessed, stay in the Word, and write the Word upon your heart.